Welcome to the first part of chapter 18. Uh, at this point we've talked about genes, what they are, where they are. Uh, we've talked about how they ultimately can produce a polypeptide. So now we're going to talk about a little bit of the expression as far as when should we make them go through and actually express themselves. When should we do transcription and translation? And we call that gene expression. Uh, you'll see this also will fall under the umbrella of epigenetics, which if you remember watching Ghost in Our Genes uh, was discussed and so we're going to get more into that idea where it's not just what genes you possess. It's not just the sequence of your DNA that counts. It's also ultimately what you do with it. You know, do you actually use it? Because you are capable of possessing a gene and shutting it off and just not using it. And so effectively, it's like you don't have it. So just having a gene is only half the battle. And as kind of an analogy here, we've got the light switch. It's just kind of with the top on and obviously what's below the top, the all inner workings. So that's kind of what we're going to look at is a lot of our gene control will be similar to either an on-off switch or in some cases, in most cases, it'll be a little bit more of like a dimmer switch where it's not always going to be completely off or completely on. Uh, in some cases, we'll actually have where it's somewhere in between and we can control how on it is. Uh, much like with a dimmer switch, you can make the lights go a little bit on, you know, a little bit more. It's not just all or nothing. And so for a lot of our gene expression scenarios, you'll see it's going to be somewhere in between where it's a lot less or a lot more, but it's not necessarily zero or 100%. So starting off, we're going to begin with the simpler guys. So prokaryotic gene recognition will be, wow, that is a horrible line, uh, but ultimately will be a much simpler process. Their gene regulation is simply more general. They don't do it as fine-tuned as eukaryotes will. And so for them, what they're going to do is group things together into what's called an operon. So they're going to have a series of related genes that are needed for a pathway, and they're going to put them all together. And so they can then put a, I guess you could say like an on-off type piece, right before all those genes, so it can control if we turn the group on or the group off. So this is a very good, efficient, acceptable way of doing things, uh, but it does still deal with things as a group. We can't go through and turn on just enzyme, if we think of it as being uh, over here like enzyme A, B, C, D, or enzyme 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever you want. We can't, in an operon model, typically turn on just this one. We're normally going to turn on all these guys or none. So that kind of makes it where it's a little bit less fine-tuned. It's not going to be as, as useful in a complex scenario. But for prokaryotes, this model works pretty good. And so what they're going to do is try to use as few of their genes as possible. Because every time you use a gene, every time you go through transcription, translation, this takes energy. And so the fewer genes, the fewer products that you can produce from those genes, the better off you are because you're saving energy, you're conserving energy. If they're not necessary to thrive, why have them? Why use them? And so there'll be several processes that will control this. Gene regulation will be more of like a uh, actual regulatory molecules. This will be a little bit more involved, we'll see. Uh, but feedback inhibition is one where we can shut off enzymes or pathways if we get too much of their end product. So in this case, you can see if we get too much of P, this kind of, wow, that is not on there, too much of P, it ultimately can come back and shut down this process so we stop doing it. And you'll notice it usually impacts it earlier in the process because, once again, that saves us energy. Why do part of the conversion when you can just not do any of the conversion process? So this is feedback inhibition, and there's multiple different ways this happens. So in some cases, you can see some of these pathways will split. So in this case, you can see that C can be used for two different reactions, and the products for each of those can shut the reaction off there, and too much C can shut off the original, so some of our pathways get a bit more convoluted, but we still have feedback inhibition in many of those pathways. It just gets a little bit more complex, where each one kind of shuts off its specific precursor. So in this case, to get P1, where it really splits is when we're get producing this D molecule. So we can shut that down, which is about as early as we can go without affecting the other pathway. If too much P1 shut down the whole pathway, we wouldn't be able to produce enough P2, and that could be lethal. So once again, evolution will make it where just the guys who have these systems that are going to allow you to live and allow you to be successful enough to reproduce, 
uh, just those pathways are going to make it through. And so if somebody has a really screwed up feedback inhibition system where they're blocking stuff that they shouldn't or blocking a different pathway that they shouldn't, those individuals would in most cases then die or be impacted negatively so they would not reproduce as much and they would not be able to pass that on. So getting a bit more specific on the operons, because there's two general types of operons. And so these two general types of operons are going to be repressible and inducible. So these repressible guys, like the tryptophan is the common example, uh, these ones are often going to be building something, so synthesis. And the idea here is if we need the stuff, which many of these we need consistently, so these are not kind of optional. So we're going to build it by default. This is going to be by default on if it's repressible. But we can turn it off if we have too much of it to make sure we don't overproduce. So we can repress it, turn it off, but by default it's on. The inducible operons are oftentimes going to be more, uh, we'll say, digestive, more uh, about breakdown or hydrolysis, such as the lac operon, which is lactose. It's going to break down lactose, the sugar. And so these ones are oftentimes, or shouldn't say oftentimes, always uh, going to be off by default. Because unless we've eaten something, why do we need to have an enzyme to break it down? So if we detect the presence of something, we'll typically start to turn this one on. We can induce it, turn it on. And in some cases, even if the stuff is present, if another food we prefer is there, we might still keep it pretty much off. Just like you guys might have where you love pizza. And that's great, you should, it's, it's wonderful stuff. Now if I come out and bring out broccoli and cauliflower and other foods that can be eaten, I've been told they're edible. You would not typically eat them though, so long as pizza's available. So we wouldn't need those enzymes to break them down, assuming we can in our wonderful analogy world. Uh, we wouldn't need those enzymes so long as pizza's there. Now if the pizza dries up and I'm hungry enough, I will start to look, perhaps, tastily, hungrily, uh, at the cauliflower and at that broccoli, and I would need the enzymes at that point. And so when I start eating that, my body can pick that up, and so it's essentially able to turn this on, but it's off by default. And then with this process, we're still going to have this kind of promoter idea, which is going to be where RNA polymerase will bind to start transcribing a series of genes. So it's going to go through and transcribe all the enzymes we need to break down lactose. It's going to transcribe all the enzymes that we need to build tryptophan as we turn one of these operons on. Uh, but they're going to have an extra piece. And this extra piece is called the operator. And the operator is going to be in front of the promoter, and it's going to essentially determine whether or not RNA polymerase can get to the promoter. So it can essentially block. So think of like something big that just kind of sits down in that operator. And it's kind of like if you're on the plane and you've got like a heavier person that sits there and lifts up the seat. And so you get where they kind of take up a little bit more than a seat. And so they block access to part of your own seat. Not to be discriminatory, uh, but ultimately this is what you're going to see where when something binds to this operator, it typically kind of spreads over onto the promoter as well. And so this means polymerase can't access that promoter because it's partially blocked. And so that will effectively shut off the entire operon. And then if you have an inducer molecule, if somebody removes that repressor protein, removes the guy who's blocking it, it now makes it accessible so something would be capable of binding there, RNA polymerase in this case, and going through and doing transcription. And once we have transcription in a prokaryote, translation immediately follows. There's nothing fancy here. And so ultimately we would express all the genes that are part of that operon. So looking here, the inducible one, this is just showing you the specific thing. We've got three genes that are part of this lac operon. And so we are going to have this kind of intro region where polymerase wants to attach here. This is the promoter region in front of these genes. And so if we have where there's not a whole lot of glucose, which is their preferred food, but plenty of lactose, we will have where RNA polymerase will bind and it will work. And in this case it does so because there's a specific activator protein that attaches that allows this process to occur. So we said that this one's off by default. So if it's just kind of left B, it's off, it, it's off, it won't work. You have to actually bind an activator protein to allow RNA polymerase to then come in to turn it on. 
You can then, if you've decided that it's not something you want to do, you can, instead of having the activator protein there, you can have the repressor protein. And so the repressor protein here, that blocks it. You'll see it's kind of binding and spilling over where polymerase should go. And so this process won't be able to happen. We can't do it. And that will occur if there's not much lactose. So lactose is unavailable. Uh, it'll also occur in large, in large part uh, if you have where there's a lot of glucose. You'll see there might be some expression. I told you there's like that knob where ultimately we might get a bit of expression if lactose is available. But so long as a preferred food source is available, you'll see that usually it's going to be a lower amount. You can see it's kind of in between where it doesn't know what to do. So it doesn't have the activator or the repressor. And without the activator or repressor, it works a little, but it's very seldom that it happens. So it's that dimmer switch that's turned down pretty low. It's pretty close to off. And so if you really want to turn this on, you have to have glucose unavailable and lactose available because lactose is not the normal preferred sugar. If there's glucose or another sugar available, they prefer that instead. So lacoperon, activator protein turns it on, all of them get transcribed. If you don't have the activator protein and you have nothing else, it's just kind of normal, it will be really, really, really slightly on. And if you have the repressor there, it's off. You're just, you're not going to make this. It's not going to happen. Now the tryptophan operon is going to be kind of the opposite. So if you leave this one be, it's typically going to produce the end product. So it's going to go through and do these series of genes. You'll see there's a bunch of them. There's quite a few here. Uh, so if you kind of leave it be, it's ultimately going to work. It's going to go through and produce tryptophan. But the cool thing about this is you can have the repressor come in, and this repressor will become a repressor protein. It gets activated if tryptophan is present. So tryptophan will actually bind to and turn on this repressor protein, which then will bind to the operator, and the operator will now block the promoter regions. You can see it's in between the genes and the promoter, and so it prevents us from attaching the RNA polymerase and being able to read this whole molecule. And so this one's going to be, by default, on, because if this repressor protein's not there, this can come in and it can work. but if we bind that repressor, it shuts the process off. Now, if we start to lose our tryptophan, if it starts to get used up, that means there's less available for these repressor proteins. So typically, the repressors will shift back to their inactive form, detach, and it will turn itself back on. So that's kind of our operon system. And then just to kind of do the basics, and we'll finish up the rest of this with the next podcast. So in eukaryotic expression, I want you guys to realize it's going to be a lot more complex because each gene will stand on its own. So instead of having where, like school, I can flip a light switch and like 18 lights come on because I've only got two light switches, the front lights, which there's like four of, and I've got the rest of the room, which there's a lot of. And so that would be like the prokaryotic model. That's like an operon where I flip the switch and a series of genes that are related come on. So in this case, the lights are related. They're in a specific area. They all come on. With eukaryotic gene expression, it would be like if I have a bank of like 24 switches and so each individual light, each individual fluorescent in the ceiling, I can flip on or off one by one by one. Now that would be way more annoying if I would actually go in and do that. But for eukaryotes, this is very useful because it gives us a lot more ability to fine tune what we want to do. Because we tend to have as eukaryotes, uh, and especially as multicellular eukaryotes, we tend to have a lot more stuff because we're bigger, we have more room for stuff. You know, part of being bigger with more energy needs is we have to have a bigger repertoire of possible enzymes to get food, to get enough energy, because all of our needs go up as well. You know, there's something to be said for prokaryotic simplicity, where yes, they're small, yes, they tend to have fewer pathways per cell, but they also have a lot lower needs. So we have a lot of money, if you will, that, that is coming in, or I should say going out, but that means we have to have a lot of money coming in would be the idea there because we have to support all of our size and all of the stuff that we have. Otherwise, you go in debt, and in debt for a cell means debt. And so we're going to have where even though, and this is another reason it's so critical that we have this fine tuning, is with multicellular organisms, we have something called genomic equivalence. And what this means is every cell in your body that's somatic, you know, sex cells, yeah, whatever, they're weird. Uh, but every cell in your body that's somatic will have the exact same genes as every other cell. So we call that genomic equivalence. Same DNA essentially in all of our cells. But they're specialized. We have liver cells and kidney cells and eye cells. 
hair follicles. Each of these things is phenotypically, physiologically, anatomically, whatever word you want to come up with, different from the others, and we can only see that. You don't confuse a liver for an eye, at least not if you're halfway intelligent here. Uh, so we can tell there's something different about them despite the fact they have the same DNA. And this is where the idea comes in of gene expression because we're using the genes that we possess differently in a skin cell versus a liver cell versus a hair follicle versus whatever other cell you want to come up with, you know, fill in your own. Uh, and so even though they have the same information, it's not being used or utilized in the same way. And that's this idea of gene expression. That's why it's important, it's so accurate, so that each of our specialized cells can accomplish what it needs to despite the fact it only has the same pool of resources to work with. So it has to be able to kind of adjust them. And if we screw this up, we can get disorders, diseases such as cancer, where if we accidentally turn off a gene, it's just as bad as damaging it or mutating it. You know, if the, you turn off a gene uh, through the process of gene expression that says don't be a tumor, a tumor suppression gene, you can ultimately have that be one of the steps that leads to cancer despite the fact that we didn't actually physically damage the sequence. The sequence is still there saying don't be a tumor cell, but we've essentially just tied it up, gagged it, made it sit there unable to do its job. And so you can get things like cancer because of that. So we're finding that even some things like disorders that we always thought were just that you had a faulty gene, in some cases at least, they're coming back to this idea of gene expression. That it's not that you have a faulty gene, it's that you're using it wrong. You just don't know what to do with the gene that you have. And so I tried to show that with the library where each person can go in and we all have the same library that we can access if we go into the same physical building. But what books we access differs. And that allows for us to be different. Where if you study all the electrical books, you could be an electrician. If you study all of the fantasy books, you could be unemployed. Everybody can kind of go their own pathway based upon which things they look at. And that's kind of the idea we see with gene expression and this idea of specialization. Yes, we have access to the same genes, but how we use those genes determines ultimately who the cell is and what it's capable of doing. That'll wrap up today, and I'll see you guys soon.